Hello everyone, uh, salam, uh, thank you for having me. My name is Josh Patterson and I am uh, the Executive Director of the BC Civil Liberties Association, which is Canada's oldest and largest human rights and civil liberties uh, outfit based here in Vancouver. Um, two weeks ago, as you know, Parliament passed the new citizenship bill, which introduces sweeping changes to Canada's citizenship laws. This law makes citizenship harder to get, and it makes it easier to lose. The so-called Strengthening Canadian Citizenship Act does exactly the opposite of what its title proclaims. It weakens Canadian citizenship. In Canada, lawfully obtained citizenship has always been permanent. Once you become a Canadian, you are always a Canadian. But now, the government is turning that upside down, and they are making citizenship less secure, making the citizenship of some Canadians worth less than the citizenship of others. Now, I want to say right off the top, at BC Civil Liberties Association, we're not just concerned about citizens' rights. We think that everyone here on Canada's soil has <coughs> fundamental human rights. That's part of the law, okay? But, but, there is something different about citizenship. There's something additional about citizenship, and that is the right to have all of those other rights permanently here in Canada. It means a right to be a permanent part of the society, a permanent part of the democracy, no matter what you do, no matter what act you commit, no matter where you are from. And this bill will make it harder for people to obtain those rights. It's particularly poignant that all of this is happening on the 100th anniversary of the tragedy of the Komagata Maru. Canada has a history, a well-trodden history of using its laws and using its power to exclude people, to create second-class uh, versions of people. And that's what we're doing here again. You know, it was a legal trick that was used to keep the people out from the Komagata Maru. And that same legal trick the continuous journey provision saying you couldn't stop over in Hong Kong or you didn't have a right to come here is a trick that the Canadian government brought back in a few years ago with a safe third country provision that refugees couldn't stop off somewhere. I mean, we're seeing these kinds of things come back and uh, similarly, these measures of creating second class Canadians, of creating a new punishment of exile is stuff that, that should have gone away hundreds of years ago and yet here we are bringing it back. There, under this new law, no longer will all Canadians have equal rights of citizenship. Instead, there will be different kinds of citizens. There are going to be first-class Canadians, Canadians who hold no other citizenship, whose citizenship is protected forever. And there will be second-class Canadians who either are dual citizens or have the right to obtain citizenship somewhere else because of their family history. They are going to have fewer rights than, uh, than the kinds of, than the first class Canadians who only have Canadian citizenship. So I'm going to just give a few, I've been asked to give a very few points about what this law is actually going to do so that people understand as a basis for all the stuff we're going to be talking about. This law is going to make citizenship harder to get. It's going to grant government officials the authority to deny citizenship merely on the speculation that someone doesn't intend to reside in Canada in the future. It's going to make it harder for students, for workers and refugees to become citizens by stopping them from counting the time they've spent in Canada uh, prior to becoming a permanent resident as part of the time they need to spend in order to become citizens. And then we're going to make it harder again by doing things like widening the requirements for people to learn English or French or to be able to prove that they can speak English or French, lengthening the time to qualify from three to four years. It goes on and on. And then we're going to be making citizenship easier to lose. And every time I, uh, I, I flip this, it, it, uh, the orientation changes, so I lose where I am in my remarks. So pardon me, I'm just going to turn it on. Okay, portrait mode. All right. Um, <laughs> This law makes it possible to eliminate a dual citizen's Canadian citizenship without even having to go to court in certain circumstances. It means that Canadians will be vulnerable 
to faceless government bureaucrats abusing their power. That's not how democracy is supposed to work. Whoa! <laughs> Close one. All right. So, what's it going to do? Like I said, it's going to push Canada back to the Dark Ages by reviving exile as a punishment for certain serious criminal offenses, espionage, treason, and terrorism. And citizenship will be able to be taken away from those people without a court hearing. They're just going to have a paper-based hearing. That is how countries punish people hundreds of years ago before we developed a modern legal system with prisons and rehabilitation. And this is just wrong. We say if a Canadian is convicted of a crime, we don't say they should be able to get away with it. Fine, they, they, they should face justice, and if they need punishment, they should be punished and rehabilitated and all that sort of thing. But we should be doing that here in Canada with our own justice system. We should not then be saying that you are exiled, you are banished from your homeland, using banishment as a punishment, and letting bureaucrats and ministers do that, not a court of law. This new law is going to put people who've moved here from undemocratic countries or countries that don't have a, a good respect for the rule of law at risk. Just in the past month, we've seen the, the, the terrible case of, of the Canadian Egyptian journalist Mohamed Fami. Works for Al Jazeera, he's in Egypt just doing his job covering uh, the protests and so forth against the, against the government. And he's put into a show trial with very little evidence. He's convicted of terrorism and sentenced to seven years in an Egyptian court. He would now be vulnerable under this new law to having his citizenship taken away from him. It's not just people who commit these offenses here in Canada. It's wherever in the world. And that means people who may be dissidents in other countries, that the home country decides, well, we don't like that person very much in their activism. Let's have a trial and convict them in absentia. They're over in Canada, but let's just have some trial. Any of those people could be vulnerable to having their citizenship taken away. But it gets worse. It gets worse. Because this new citizenship law is creating a rule whereby all new citizens, not people who are already citizens, and I want to make this clear, no one who's already a Canadian citizen is at risk of this particular provision, but anyone who becomes a new citizen after this comes into force is going to have to convince the government of their intent to reside in the country. Now there's a whole bunch of problems with that, uh, not least being that it's not the government's job to enforce where citizens live. Citizens have the right to live here, to live somewhere else, to live wherever the heck they want, to come and go as they please. That's part of citizenship. But anyways, the government is going to be putting this into place. Now when you combine that with the part of the citizenship law that already exists, that if you misrepresent yourself in order to obtain Canadian citizenship, here's what might happen. A new Canadian, uh, a few months after they swear their oath and become a Canadian, they, their mom gets sick and they move back home. Uh, they get offered a job in England or in Dubai or somewhere else and they decide to move there and oops, they fall in love and then they get married there and before they know it, they're living there and they've got kids. Any of the people in those kinds of situation could be at risk under the new system of losing their Canadian citizenship, of having their citizenship stripped from them because a government bureaucrat might say when they walk into the Canadian consulate or embassy to register, oh, I'm here living abroad now. Uh, remove me if there's some big problem that happens in this country. They'll say, oh, well, that's very interesting. I thought you just became a Canadian three months ago. Maybe we should start looking at whether or not you truly intended to live in the country. This is going to be a huge problem that puts new Canadians in a state of uncertainty. If you are born here, you can move wherever the heck you want. No one is ever going to tell you that you can't. But new Canadians, after this law comes into force, are going to have to think twice about whether or not they decide to take up that job abroad, whether or not they decide to go to school in Paris or in London or in Amritsar. So uh, it is a very, very problematic law for all of those reasons. And Canadians do care very, very deeply about this. As Harsha said, 44,000 Canadians almost have signed a petition against this to get the law stopped, but the government didn't stop it. People spoke to MPs, people testified in front of Parliament, people wrote reports, and still the government didn't stop. Opposition parties spoke up against it, still the government didn't stop. It didn't slow down, they didn't even consult the public. They rushed ahead and they passed this law, 
that takes away equal rights of citizenship, and that's why this law is going to be challenged. We think that this law is unconstitutional. There is going to be a legal challenge to this law, and it is, it is about a principle, an important principle, that, is a, that a Canadian is a Canadian and we do not make distinctions, even as a punishment. The U.S. Supreme Court has actually said this, that citizenship is not a license that should expire because of someone's misbehavior. It is not, a, a, a citizenship is not to be used as a weapon to take away from people uh, to express our displeasure at their conduct. That's actually an enshrined constitutional right in the United States. We want to make sure that that right is recognized here in Canada. And we're going to fight to do that. Stripping Canadians of their citizenship is an arbitrary and a medieval practice that serves no valid purpose, that is inconsistent with basic notions of justice, and we think inconsistent with the Constitution. And we see this as just another part of a policy agenda to be less just to newcomers to this country. We've seen the unjust changes to refugee law. We've seen the cruel attempt, the cruel and unusual attempt, said the courts, to take health care away from refugee claimants who are lawfully here in the country that the court just yesterday, the federal court, overturned. We've seen the discussions about removing consular services from people who are dual citizens just because they happen to live abroad and, 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 you know, a lot of furrowing of brows when something goes wrong in another country and Canadians come to the embassy gate holding their passport. Now the government is going to start checking their tax returns to see how often they filed in Canada. We say that that's wrong. We say that Canada owes protection to its citizens regardless of how long they live abroad. And the list just goes on and on. And coming soon, coming soon to a parliament near you, is going to be a proposed law to say that no longer will it be the case that babies born on Canadian soil are automatically Canadian citizens. They're going to make sure, or they intend to, that only Canadians, only babies born to Canadians are going to have Canadian citizenship. For no reason whatsoever. This overturns the entire history of Canadian citizenship law and is designed for no reason at all just to try and punish a group of people that deserve no punishment at all who are babies. All of these changes, including the citizenship change, affect uh, by a vast majority people of color, uh, immigrants, it's not, it's not people like me who are going to be at risk, and I am a dual citizen. It's not people like me who are going to be at the most risk of having citizenship revoked. It's going to be people of color, it's going, and, and this is one of the reasons why we find this law so egregious. Now, I don't want to create alarm. They're not going to be just stripping Canadian citizenship willy-nilly from any person who goes abroad or any of these kinds of things. In fact, the government has even said, oh, no, 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 we, we don't. We don't want to do that. We don't intend to do that. Well, they had an opportunity to change the law, and they didn't. They should have changed the law if that's not what they mean to do, and we're going to challenge that too. So, I, you know, I do not mean to create alarm with this, but what I do mean to say is that by putting these changes in place, even those of us who will never have revocation proceedings brought against us, dual citizens now have a new legal trap door underneath them. We have slightly less rights than other Canadians for no reason other than the fact that we or members of our family were born somewhere else. It's not fair, it's not just, it's unconstitutional, and we intend to challenge it. Uh, there is going to be a legal challenge filed by the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers, and we've announced uh, publicly that we're going to be supporting them in that. There's already been a challenge filed, uh, so we needn't lose hope. Civil society is on a roll, challenging these unconstitutional measures. We've seen judgment after judgment after judgment in the last few months, where the government hasn't respected the Constitution, and those laws are falling down by the wayside. We hope that this one will too. Thank you very much for your time. ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਦੇਸੀ 24 ਦੀ ਵਿਆਖਿਆ ਕੀਤੀ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਦੱਸਿਆ ਕਿ ਹੋ